Okay, so I think I'm ready. Yeah, I think it's too dark. So, uh, I guess welcome to this. This was just something I decided to do impromptu. Demand initially seems stronger. See how it goes as we go through this. You know, people might decide this is for them or not. That's fine as we go through it. Um, if I'm Kevin Shepard, I probably know approximately none of you. Um, I don't ever get to teach on the MPIL. I teach on the MFE all the time. So, unless you're an MFE, you probably don't know me or, or a Keeble undergraduate, except for Somebody might know me, but most people don't know me. Okay, so today is really going to be about, you know, so you have this sort of Python course thing here, which uh, is just a bunch of tasks, it's sort of just a work in progress. This is not today's sort of test list of things we're all going to try to do in the next two hours. This is probably most of what will maybe get done in this term. You know, so basically this term is going to be what I'd call kind of core ideas. You know, I'm going to explain things you know, not just kind of this is how you do that, but you know, certainly when important things come up, I'll try to provide a little bit of stuff, background about sort of numerics and other things that are relevant for understanding this stuff if you're really going to try hard to do interesting things. Um, I don't know if many of you know much about Python other than it's sort of like MATLAB or other things. It is a lot like MATLAB. They basically borrowed a lot of ideas from MATLAB. Um, it actually has a very strong record in industry. It's less popular in academics. So if you want to get a job, it might be useful for that. It's popular in industry for one reason, or many reasons, but one reason is it's free. That's, you know, you can do whatever you want with it. And, you know, I'm not an idealist that way. Some people might be. But, uh, you know, for me, it's just about sort of functioning and things you can get done. It's also become increasingly popular because it's, you know, in practice, a lot of problems involve a lot of data, things you might call data manipulation. The stuff you have to do before you ever get to do any sort of fun econometrics, you know, in fact, often that's like 80% of the stuff you end up doing, and it's particularly good at that stuff. So it may not have, you know, different things are differently good at different things, and, you know, it's sort of competitive advantage is doing things like data cleaning and manipulation, especially if you have really messy data, like strings and just randomly unformatted stuff if you ever did, like, try to do Twitter or something like that, sort of some research. It's probably, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find anything we normally use as economists that would be better than this. But today's goal is to basically get things installed and have sort of a grand tour. If things go well, then we may make more progress than that. If they go badly, we may make less. But, um, you know, so basically the idea will be to install it. And whoever they do it is what I think you're going to say which is to use what's called a virtual environment. It's not just like installing Python or installing MATLAB. Virtual environments, they're sort of like that. It's something that you'll install sort of the core of Python bits. But what a virtual environment does, it's kind of a little custom environment that often just has the things you want and the things you need. And the reason why these are popular are a couple reasons. One is that you can have more than one on, the, on your computer. So you can actually have sort of multiple versions of things like that. Um, you know, and two, you can actually stick stuff in them and not worry about breaking anything. 
know, this is sort of the nature of this kind of stuff, is it's a little more decoupled from something like Stata or MATLAB. And so things aren't always like, you know, there's always a small chance that something can sort of break something or make something work badly. And if you have these virtual environments, then you don't have to worry about uh, these kind of things happening. You know, you could also, you know, if you're a very, very good researcher and very careful, you might worry about, you know, changing your virtual environment, for example, you're halfway through writing a paper, or you could actually have one that you use to write the paper, or you send it off, it's on a referee's desk for a year, gives you back, gives you a sort of revised piece to submit, you need to do things to it. You can still have the same virtual environment, even though on other things, you're using a different one that's sort of more up to date. So in some sense, your results are exactly reproducible. You know, this is not true, for example, it's, it's generally almost true in things like MATLAB, but if you upgrade versions, there are things that can break. There are actually some chances, you know, they made some improvements, which can lead to, you know, not getting exactly the same numerical results from what is otherwise the same code, because there's things called numerical precision that, you know, there's sort of always a fudge factor or something you can't exactly get, you know, that, that doesn't tell you what to do with the last little bits. And so different people can do different things. Different choices will change these things. I mean, in MATLAB, particularly one thing I've come across is, you know, opti the optimizers in particular tend to have a lot of progress, which is good and that they get better, but it's bad in that, you know, just because they found one optimum on two versions ago and now you've upgraded it, you find a different optimum. And, you know, that can be a bit dicey, especially if it's far, you know, if it's far away. It's usually not too far away, but it's just not numerically the same, which is a little disconcerting because it just sort of took a different path to get there, maybe a better path. But, you know, differs in the third or fourth digit, which, you know, from an from encounter's point of view, that usually doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, these are things that you can sort of try to avoid with these. And then once we talk about virtual environments, we'll talk about sort of ways to sort of use Python. The way you should never use Python is, the Python interpreter, which is the first one. Like, it's completely useless for anything other than running Python stuff. But most of the focus will be on these three, which all have different versions, so we call called IPython, so interactive Python. Um, and then the last thing we'll talk about is sort of Spider. And Spider is, will be familiar if you're used to sort of MATLAB or RStudio and these kind of things. It's sort of a, I call it a lightweight IDE, integrated development environment, that is, you know, it is sort of, it's very useful and has a lot of sort of very nice, helpful things. If you ever get really sort of serious and do more sophisticated Python things, there are other ones out there that go well beyond that that actually have a lot more capabilities, but the learning curve on those is quite steep. So I think for, for these purposes of this course, Spider will be as far as we'll need to go. And if you really end up doing it a lot, we can do sort of different things. But just a very brief introduction to what, you know, some people call Python. Actually, a lot of things that go into this. And um, obviously, there's sort of Python. Any of you ones that ever thought about Python might know that there's sort of two versions at the same time. 2.7.6 is the one I'm going to use, which is the last one. I don't know, 2.6 is the last one, but 2.7 is the last one on what's called Python 2. They made some very you know, difficult decisions to sort of invoke things in Python 3. So there's still some things that don't quite work. Almost there. I think from our point of view, there's very little difference. If you do stuff like web programming and things like that, there's a type of people that agree. But I think there's very little that most people that are economic type problems in solving that with Python would really care much about the two. Eventually, if I get to move and get inside the two tweets that I'll actually talk about today, there's basically no difference. And you probably wouldn't even notice it, you know, if you actually sort of were forced to use a different one. So eventually you'll be able to move it away your problem. Um, but Python is sort of, again, it's all these sort of different sort of modules that sort of come in to make sort of this sort of stack. NumPy is sort of the, you know, going to be one of the core ones, and again, depending on how far we get to, we might get into the sort of fringes of that, but probably not. But NumPy basically provides sort of a rule level library that sort of you can read and make your things. So they're useful because when you want to actually start doing harder things in, in sort of, you know, and data arranged in nice ways that sort of make sense to the computer, and then you can actually get things to go very quickly. And so it's sort of it's sort of a very specialized library that will use it all the time, but it kind of you know it's not very interesting in that sense. You know, it provides what the arrays will use, and everything else will use all come from NumPy, and it does some of the lower level performance stuff, but it's not usually kind of really interesting or sort of like it's not usually stuff you use at the end, it's something you use along the way, but it's not really an end product. SciPy sort of is, a, is very closely related to NumPy, 
And it's even closer to getting things that you enjoy. Because there are things that you think that I don't know if they're less cool. Or you think of things that you know you care about. It's not that there are only things that are the optimization. The little things you see here, these are common abbreviations you'll find out probably you said from time to time. And you certainly never you know, get past the core of the human being and find people often abbreviate in I and D, right, right. And some basic statistics you might care about, and they sort of live in their little thing, you won't see the individual these things. And finally, getting to things that are getting closer, that's about lives, is sort of the main body of identity these days. Um, you also just call it DLT when they start getting abbreviations for it. The evidence makes reasonably good pictures. Some people think it requires too much typing because it's quite low, it's kind of low level. If any of you know R or tried R, there are sort of equivalence for Python, so you can actually do ggplot2 type things. I never got into that, so I'm not going to bother with it. Um, and then the last thing we're getting to the particular data work, the Panda has been a very big success for Python, um, so much so that MATLAB has basically copied it because um, it's a data management for what it does. It takes these arrays and matrices and dumps and rows and columns and numbers, and it just in some sense puts surrounding stuff around them. And here we've got R, right? Like so this frame, you know, data frame is kind of like the way you think about it is like an array of matrices, it's kind of like a text file with no columns and that stuff in it. What Panda does is it makes it to just kind of a very basic disk file that basically what makes it all the way through. And it's got rows and columns, and the access is rows and columns, they're sort of groups, you know, columns can have names. Names, of course, can be meaningful. And so instead of just having a, a big matrix of your regressors, X, which has, you know, 10 columns and 100 rows, you have a more meaningful thing where each column has a name and that each row can actually have a name. So you can have like, you know, if you have variable names, you might say states in the US as an example. You actually can have rows on both names on both sides. So actually immediately you can just see what different things are. And so you don't have to kind of go back to your memory or look through another array where you stored the, the state indices and things like that and you know what it's going to tell things like that. And it's never been found or Metric library. It sort of has things like OLS and GLS, formal models, generalized linear models, which include things like probit, things, you know, models like that. Probit does have actual just strict probit code. So you know, it's, it's sort of getting there. It needs some more work probably to start to get into the corner. It's a what I call complete library, but you know, I can't get a couple of versions that will also be there. And then the last bit, which is in one hand the most useful, but the least interesting. Python, which is actually kind of what most people do most of their work in. So a lot of the work is done in IPython, which is interactive Python, which is just basically a shell that provides a lot of stuff that we like to use and see. All right, so who has gone so far as to download? Has everyone downloaded the installer? Has everyone just installed it already? Did anyone not install it? Someone put their hand up. Now is the time to install it. <laughs> if you haven't done so already, but we're not going to be, we're not going to be just, you know, we're going to go beyond that because we're going to do these virtual environment thing. And so these are, you know, I, I, I don't know. I always include Linux just to try to be fair. Is anyone actually using Linux? All right, one break for me. Two breaks. One, just one. Okay. And, you know, I'm just saying this because you know Linux on a laptop can be a real battle. Uh, Well, I don't want to lose you. You know, this is the the joy of doing computing things is you're, we've got to kind of go together as opposed to lectures where you can just leave eighty percent of the audience behind. <laughs> and you see, eventually, we're going to get. 
eventually we're going to get to this point. So why don't we just go ahead while he's installing, and he'll give me all the catch up to this. This is not too bad. So what we want to do then is we want to open up a, a if you do Windows, you want to open CMD. I have one open, which is doing something that it shouldn't be doing. So I'll open a new one. So like that. And if you have Mac, you should open terminal. And then what you should do is change to wherever Anaconda is located. And I'm not going to be able to literally show you the command because mine is set up in a weird way. But Windows is the Anaconda, and most people who use Mac will have it in, as you see here, it should be uh, you know your home directory and then Anaconda. And once we're done with that, we're going to install this virtual environment. Use, but we usually won't be directly interacting with any of them. Some of them, a few of them we will, that I didn't mention. Um, they have the last two, XLRD and XLWT, are things that you can use to read and write Excel files yourself. We'll often use a web that Pandas also provides a method. Pandas, of course, depends on these things, so we use them. But, you know, Pandas provide an easier way, but then you know, we want to use sophisticated things. We might need to do it ourselves. But these are the kind of things you can do. So at least for this annual, they are on the website, so you can see this small and also copy and paste. So you don't have to sit around and type this thing. I try to make it a little bigger if possible. There. So click on, if you go to my homepage, you see Python course. Sort of about halfway down. You know, there should be a link there. It'll take you to another page, and that another page will then take us to the slide. So yeah, it might be easier to copy and paste that command in the slide. Okay, do we have any progress?
you're having some, some issues and uh, yeah just give me half a second and just one thing that's useful is because you know, especially if the network's timing out and you're having weird problems um, if you're having weird problems you know so to install the environment it's conda create type you know and then sort of you know packages right where packages is this long sort of epically long thing if you imagine you're having some trouble, and we're having, many of us are having trouble today, the good news is it is a one-off thing. You know, this will not be a problem in the future. You know, had I known this, I've never done this sort of Python teaching before, I would have provided very clear guidance of exactly to do this in the time before here, because this is not a very productive use of our time. But we're here, so we should try to uh, make the most of it. Um, but, then, but then the thing is, if you imagine you get some packages in, in fact, if you're having trouble, the one I would suggest first is you just install this one package, NumPy. NumPy, again, it's the core, it's the kind of most kernel package. I think it's installing many other packages that actually depend on NumPy, so it's going to install that anyway, and then you try to install other stuff. So it's useful just to do, con just do NumPy first, but then if you have done that one by itself, for example, you can just use conda install dash n econ. What's happening here is, you know, obviously the second one is sort of the action conda is being told to do, create, install, Etc. The dash n econ is telling it dash n is saying the name of environment. environment. Yeah, so the first word after dash n it always interprets as the environment, and then you could put, uh, you know, you could put other things here that you know that you also wanted to put in in this time, and of course then you can do it kind of incrementally if things are getting difficult and there's not going to be any problem. I thought I would to the yeah. Very quiet. Okay. I can try to turn it up. Is it not? Is this like talking about people in this room or people somewhere else? Okay. I don't know. This is also an experiment, so apparently it's uh, not working. Is it here? Okay. I don't know how well it's going to work. It's like kind of. Doesn't seem to be picking. Oh, uh, maybe picking up some stuff now. I'm <laughs> 
questions or we're all just making slow progress.
Uh, okay, so while we're sort of in different states, I guess I can use this opportunity a little bit to just talk about some of the things, even though we can't really do it ever. But I can you know certainly show you a little bit just of some of the things, and again, we're going to go through it eventually. But uh, you know, there's basically for some of you, some of the people on the Mac, Mac you get a nice installer, you get a nice launcher, which actually has three things on it. There's sort of a notebook, there's IPython, IPython QT console, um, and IPython notebook. Those are the three main ways to use IPython. And just to sort of get an idea of what IPython is, if you use Windows, I mean IPython, what it is, it's a it's an interactive Python environment. And it has some stuff going on. You can maybe run it in Windows Circle. If you use Windows, you should never run it this way. Because the Windows kernel, sort of CMD, is very useless. And it just makes for a very bad experience. So if you're a Windows person, you never run it that way. The more useful way, which will I will certainly use for the course, is what's called the QT console. And this is not the size I have to see it. I'm not that blind. This is the size here. You know, the nice thing about it is you can customize it a lot. Fonts, font sizes, lots of things. And for an updated QT, it's a big font, so hopefully people even in the back eventually if they ever got the point of doing anything could see it. And this is a much, much more useful way to sort of do it. And in particular, it's certainly on Windows, the QT console. But I think I also use Linux. And on Linux, I also use the QT console because I think it's these days it's better than actually the terminal in Linux. In fact, some people have suggested that I found the kind of sort of standard Linux terminal replacement in the long run. But whether that'll happen or not, who knows? But so this is sort of you know what we're going to basically get to. This is what I think of, you know, if you're used to MATLAB or other things, it's just obviously. This is not sort of editor. This is just a way to sort of quickly enter commands. The other thing we're going to talk about eventually again is this idea of spider, which is this kind of the widest way for a sort of scientific IDE for Python. It will also depend on IPython. So in the end, you'll have one of these windows just like this that will actually be docked inside of the sort of spider environment, which is probably the best way so that you start getting productive. But you know, so this is sort of the second way, and the third way. Which is again a relatively new way, which those of you who have tried no to launch Notebook, you see, is this looks quite strange, which is actually open the browser window, and you can actually, if you really want to, and it's good for teaching, but I'm not sure it's good for actual regular environment. You can actually basically run the same commands through a browser. In some sense, the QT console is actually the same thing, but just different representations. Does anybody just use Mathematica? That's sort of how IPython works, and that there's a kernel in the background. That's actually where all the computation and stuff is done. Then in theory, almost anything can talk to the kernel. So that's what's happening here, is this is a browser talking to the kernel. The QT console is a QT, which is a sort of Nokia thing. Um, you know, it was a once a Nokia thing that you know basically does the same thing. It also talks to the kernel. It's like Mathematica. You can Mathematica restart the kernel if something goes wrong or it crashes or whatever. Same kind of idea here. In fact, you can actually restart the kernel. You know, in that sense, it's very, very similar. So if I have an IPython thing, right one, the big one. So you see here, there's kernel. And if I want, you can do things like restart the kernel, and it always says you really want to do this. And I really do. And eventually, that'll just give me essentially a new. It gives me a new environment. So this is sort of what's going on here. It's not much fun that we can't do it together. Let's actually see things. And I just mentioning mathematics. Can you do? Like symbolic things? Yes. yes. I wasn't planning on covering it because I don't use it for that, but there's a package called SymPy, also in Anaconda, that does symbolic stuff. It's, you know, no one believes it's as good as Mathematica. Mathematica is considered to be really, really good and quite far ahead of most stuff. On the other hand, if you just want to get some derivatives right, it's probably more than good enough to make sure that the derivatives you did and you know, simplify them and do all that kind of really boring, sometimes quite tedious stuff. You know, on the other hand, if you want some very complex integrals and things like that, it may not be as useful for doing that. But I've never, you know, this is just stuff I've read around or saw as I sort of do stuff. But I've never actually tried to use it. But, you know, I also use the symbolic stuff in MATLAB, which is also, but again, just for doing things like checking derivatives and things like that. Um, but this I find that, this I find that even though it looks like a regular terminal, it's actually quite useful. And that of course some of you who have actually seen it, it does sort of syntax highlighting. 
So special words like import, which is going to be one of the special words we're going to be using a lot, these will change color. So I've just imported NumPy. It also supports, which is very useful, tab completion. So if you don't know the command, you can just start hitting tab. And in fact, once you hit tab, you can actually then just start going through the list and scrolling around until you actually find the thing you want. You can also go back to start typing. And then, of course, it'll just find all the ones that match something like that. So that's sort of another sort of very useful feature that sort of helps to become pretty productive because it's not just sort of a really dumb terminal. It's actually quite smart. And this is, it does, it's not just something special about NumPy. It actually essentially gives you know, inspection of the package. And everything you want to package it will always have whatever that package is out there. So this is the person who needs something outside of the system or inside of the system or it will be able to do sort of one of these tab completions for basically anything. The other thing it's, it helps, which we're going to do eventually, it also supports a thing called PyLab, which again, the reference to sort of MATLAB. And what PyLab does is PyLab basically runs that import line I had before, but for a bunch of stuff. Most people consider this to be bad practice in that there's now lots and lots of things. There's, there's lots and lots of things uh, sort of installed, and that there's many, many. There's many, many packages. So, for example, if I just type A before in IPython, before I ran this PyLab command, there was actually nothing installed. There was literally nothing in the world. So the thing was basically empty. And now we run PyLab, it basically imports just a ton of the most common functions. From learning, it's extremely useful to have this. And I sort of do it. Most people, though, once they sort of advance past the kind of initial stage, is they tend to be a bit, bit careful. Because they can, of course, be, this happens to be that level a lot, but there can be name conflicts. That is, you have two things that have names of things that you want to use, and of course, that can be really painful. And that allows you to do things with the path often to make sure the one you want is above the one you didn't want, and it becomes a real exercise in tedium. The way, certainly in the long run, we're going to see this is we're going to import things, for example, NumPy. And this is where the NP I showed you before, is you use this as word. NP. And what that's going to do is it's going to basically give me an NP thing, which if I actually just type NP, it tells me if NP is a module numpy, and then me, which is slightly different from what it is for you, but that's because I'm strange that way. But if I type NP dot, and then I hit tab, now all of a sudden I have tab completion, hit tab twice, and you can actually just scroll through the list. So, you know, these are just some of the sort of trying to get a little bit of, you know, a little bit of productivity out of our time while we're waiting for incredible full downloads. Another sort of feature of this is you might have noticed that there are numbers on these lines, four, three, five. You know, the simplest thing we could do is we could just use it as a calculator. Two plus three, three to the tenth power. The star star is tenth power. Don't worry. I have this in the future to talk about these various operations. But one thing you notice is, so what happened is, of course, sort of line six, it actually has sort of number five, line seven has this number of three to the tenth. What you can do, and it also knows things, it has special characters, so underscore will be the last result. And underscore number will actually give you the number result from that number. So in fact, anything you've actually run will be remembered. More importantly, it also does history. So just like some of you, I think, have never actually done anything in command, which is perfectly fine. You know, a lot of people don't ever do that stuff. But you know, one thing you, may have, you know, someone learned is if you're in command, you can press the up and down arrow to scroll through your most recent commands. That's also true here. So you can basically scroll through commands that you've run. Some of these are ones you haven't seen because it actually stores history across sessions. So it'll have the last, I don't know, 10,000 lines or something like that you've ever wrote, you've ever written. And you know that's sort of again a very useful feature because you can just scroll back a few lines if you want to find a command you run and you wanted to change it. The other thing that supports, which is, again is really useful, and you only get this in the QT console version, is it supports what's called cell mode, which means you can actually sort of put many commands together. So I'm just going to don't worry, I'll explain all these in due time. So basically, I have three commands now. But none of them have run yet. And it won't run until I get to the end. And then I press enter twice. But you know, that's 
by itself, it doesn't look very useful. But the usefulness of this is that I can actually use it now. This cell becomes a single entry in my history. So imagine I made a little mistake or I want to change something when you're sort of doing this. You can just go back and get the last cell altogether and then just move around. Suppose I didn't want 10, but I wanted 100 numbers. You know, and then you can have many, many numbers. You know, that kind of thing. So these are kind of, you know, the basic sort of features of this sort of this, this QT console version. How do you use the variables or packages that you use from your DL. So I type DL and P. I type NP, not defined anymore. Actually, so it's, the command is reset. Reset will basically restore the session back to what it is. There's a command, again, for anybody who sort of knows MATLAB, you probably know this command, whose. And it says interactive namespace is empty, meaning that there's nothing, there's nothing actually, you know, that sort of I've created. As always, it's not an interactive namespace. It's a command by Python. It's also a Python program. And these are all kind of really near each other. But it's very separated from everything else. Sort of useful to be a this is what you will be running. You know, you'll be running in the econ environment. Mine doesn't look like that because this is a what the count you're seeing is a count I use for presenting this class because I don't want to have any of my personal things appearing on the internet. And so I make a special account. But because of that, I already have Anaconda installed on my computer or somewhere else. I keep it in my Dropbox. So that way, whichever computer I'm on, it doesn't care. It actually, you know, as like someone asked, do I want to get rid of it on Windows? You know, there isn't, I think, an uninstaller, so you can just uninstall it. On, certainly on OS X or Linux, you can just RM, RS, kill the slash Anaconda. So you get frustrated with all this, it never downloads, it's going to have done. That's it. It's gone. It doesn't, it never existed. It doesn't go around breaking things. But the other side of this is because it's kind of lightweight, in that it's not getting all into your operating system and trying to put stuff in your Windows directory and program files in special places, is that. You can actually have it in Dropbox. So you actually keep your in comments list in Dropbox, which you know for you guys is probably less important, but I have N offices with some large N in different places and each has their own computer. And so that way if I show up, if I want to learn some Python, it's always there in a state. And if I change something or I've added some stuff, it'll actually be there. And I don't have to worry about this stuff. So that's the sense it's kind of the you know, there are things you can do that are a bit sometimes more clever, and I've done that because I need it. But you know, I think it's starting to get started. I mean, it's much easier just to follow the sort of standard installation. When we're doing the system call, are we calling not the environment that we just created? Yes. It will be using the Qt console that's there, which potentially can be different from the, the sort of version that's installed by default in Anaconda. They don't actually have to be the same. You can have multiple versions installed all at the same time. You can have different virtual environments, each one. You know, if you use this for many, many years and you create a new environment every year, you typically would end up with a different, you know, the current version, which will tend to change over time. But the econ version that you did today, if you still have it 10 years from today, and you still have the computer or you back up the hard drive, in principle, it should work. And it will be exactly like it was today if you don't run some commands to sort of change it. Yeah. The other thing, I'm oh, sorry. Another question. Uh, in following up on that, you have joined it into like an office. Uh, yeah. For example, you can open it. So, would you open up? What do you mean? Open up and keep on this environment. So, eventually, certainly for, for you know, for people on Mac, it's very easy. You have a launcher that is now there on your computer, and you can use that to sort of start these things. For Windows, my Sort of notes have some examples of how to do it. At the end of the day, you know, it's easy enough to make a shortcut that you can have on your desktop. So, for example, for me, I just have this shortcut. It runs for a second, and there's sort of the you know, Qt console. In the, it will be the shortcut will have will load the virtual environment, will then launch the Qt console all in one magic sort of line, and that's it. There's no, yeah, there's nothing else. And since is that what you mean, or is it something else? Yes, yes, yes. But if, if I don't do this, I don't create a new shortcut. If I just go into yeah. Then you just open command, activate the environment, just like 
we saw. We do have to like the environment every time we have. Yes, you should. I think it's. I don't know. My intuition says it probably works right, but I know it will, will always work right if you activate the environment. But I know that there's no risk of it not working right. Yeah. So. Yeah. No. No. You need to activate the environment first. It always has to be first. What the environment does it sets some variables in a very temporary way in that command in that CMD environment in Windows, and it basically sets temporary variables. As soon as you close that CMD with those, those are gone. Yeah. They don't, you know, blast. They don't stick around. So since that's what you closed it, then you know it doesn't know anything about the virtual environment or anything in the virtual environment. So in that sense, you need to activate it first and then do it. You can write a single command, which is what all these things do, to activate the environment. And then we use and and, which just lets you chain many commands together. You just think about a command, you know, think about the command you'd use to activate the environment, and and the command you would use to launch the thing, or and and cd stuff, and then and and the command to do it. And that's all it is. It's just you know, the two or three commands you attack yourself. You're just putting that together in one very ugly long command, but there's nothing really sort of magic about it. So the other thing I had is, is this have like a, a help environment like MATLAB where you just plug in help? Yeah, so in, in, something, in IPython, the main help actually, let me just go ahead and load this iLab thing, just so I'll get a lot of stuff. So the other thing you might notice as well, I mean, I need to, I try to work it out so I can make it big at the top, because you can't see very far down, if I'm not careful, is there. So there, you know, the other thing you see is there's two things going on here. One is I have this percent sign, and then I have my lab. Percent sign is not exactly mandatory these days. Percent sign, actually, what it tells you is I kind of the words what are called magic keywords. These magic keywords are not Python commands, but they're basically a combination of many commands that are provided. And so in this case, percent PyLab is that. There's actually a lot of them. If I type ls magic, that actually will give me the list. As you can see, it's not small. These are all things. Some of the ones I ran a second ago, reset, is actually should be on this list. I don't think it's necessary to sort of know and use most of these. Some of them are really useful. But you know, in my notes, I don't you know, most of them I don't spend a lot of time talking about. There's probably, you know, ten or so that might be quite useful. The others are, you know, specialized. And they're not necessary. The more you use it, you'll probably find yourself pushing more into these if you actually end up using it. Um, you, you don't use it a lot. It's fine that they're there, but it doesn't do anything. Again, for example, you know, you can get the current directory, PWD, that's sort of where I for now for this course, where I've installed Sort of um, you know, if I want, you can use CD around. You know, and again, this is just very simply moving around. It's just very simply moving around where the actual sort of current directory is. For example, if you want to move around because you have files stored and you're actually working on your project, you can just change change directory that way in the usual way. These are all done through sort of magics. These are all CD is a magic. If you see here. What's actually working now is this idea that's actually called auto magic. So now I've turned it off, and you'll see that CD won't work anymore. It'll give me an error. I always leave it on. And what auto magic does is it basically says two things. First, I have a command like CD that's a magic command, and there's no variable called CD. Then as soon as I want the magic command. And on the other hand, I do something stupid. So for example, well, now CD will work. So it works fine. You know, now CD works fine, but if I do something stupid and find CD is equal to, say, 1, and then I try to do it again, it's not going to like it, because, of course, it knows that I've done this. But the CD is actually still there to change directories, but I now have to use the percent sign to access these magic words. So I can do that with sort of CD. Well, I'm already in test, but I can do it uh, above. And, of course, if I remove, CD as a variable using DEL, then CD will actually start working like I expect. So, but there's a question about help. There is a help. So, this IPython PD console has help in two ways. The first way is sort of explicit. So, again, this picture I loaded PyLab. So, it's been loaded. So, 
I have PyLab loaded, which will just put, like I said, a ton of stuff. So you can see there's all these things. Many of them, of course, are pretty obvious what they are. Things like, you So, for example, if I wanted to sort of get a very, very quick, one of the most useful ones we'll use a lot is array. Array is going to be the main command we use. and so on. But what if I forgot what to do? I just put a question mark afterwards, and I hit enter, and now I hit the help file, and you know, the sort of thing, and it's called a pager. So I'm actually, even though I'm there, I can press page up and page down. Mine looks really stupid because it's so big. You know, and yours it'll be much more reasonable looking. Some of these lines will, will fit fine on yours. You know, it's not, no one ever thought about what it would look like when you had 24 size font. But you know, now you can go back and forth. When you're done, you press Q. And now you're sort of finished with this. If you're really sort of gory person, array won't actually do it. Um, I just want to show you. So pandas is this data library. One of the nice things it has is it has good reading very good read it, readers for lots of sort of formats. For example, read CSV. It looks really horrible, but it does explain everything sort of in it. But there's another thing you can do as well. Again, this is, I think, kind of advanced, which is bring it to a question mark. It won't actually show you the help, but what it will do, it will actually show you the function. So you can actually be like, what was that supposed to do, or what do I think it's supposed to do, or things aren't working the way I expect. And again, I'm not saying this is necessarily the most useful example. But those are sort of so they're sort of an integrated help in that way. The other way there's the help though, which is often really useful, is if you just start typing and sort of start something that looks like a function, in this case array parentheses, it actually again might be a really bad example because of this ridiculous spot size, but it actually gives you about the first 20 lines of the help, which for most things are actually enough just to jog your memory about what sort of you need or what you actually sort of need. But again, you can always type a question mark if you want. This is kind of, again, this is a very, for some people, it's probably very scary or not nice to see. This is a bit sort of, you know, main line. We did, we talked about fire, but I really want to get into fire versus crawl a little bit before I get into the fire. The fire is the thing we're going to spend most of the time in the course. Fire will actually do a much better job of help. In fact, the fire will happen if you type array open brace. There's a little window of fire that will actually automatically load the help. In a nice formatted, good looking thing, not just for a text, but in fact a formatted thing, that all of the stuff that happens in Python. But you know, Brock might do this if he's following there, and you can know, type something else and use another function inside of the array, you know, switch to that one, you know, just switch around to the function you're currently doing. You all of a sudden have the help available for the function you want when you're actually trying to sort of So, so how are you doing for installing? So, Probably something will finish and that'll kind of help us go a little faster. Maybe not. Thank <laughs> you. 
So let me, uh, let me try to return to the plan. I think we're pretty for it. Um, and again, this is just kind of background stuff today. I don't think it's like the fact we're not getting a car for AM5. We're not going to be for the actual Python stuff. It's mostly just thinking about sort of getting a little familiar with the environment and things like that. And so I think we hopefully, I know a couple guys are you know, the extremely slow internet here. I think a couple of guys are still uh, hopefully going to make some, you know, be able to sort of make some progress. So we have this sort of, just going through my task list here. We have the, the other thing I suggested, and it's not necessary, but you know, as you start getting into these things, a good text editor is really useful. So if you don't have a good text editor, you should think of one. I like this one called Sublime Text 3. That's actually what this one is here. It knows a lot. It knows things about Python. It knows things about a lot of things. And it gives you nice syntax highlighting. And sometimes it is useful just to have a quick uh, text editor if you're not doing that. But it's not essential. That was sort of an optional thing. Um, but then, so for those of you that can get IPython open, let's start and actually just sort of see some commands and see some command syntax to start making some sense of stuff. So I'm just going to reset mine to make sure I'm back to sort of scratch. And so this is assuming you could open IPython, so you should get something, you should get something like this. In fact, just to make it even more like Scratch, I'll just restart my kernel, which will give me a one. It should give me a one. So now I'm back to one. I'm actually back to one, which is something you should have. You have the banner at the top that will tell you things. And you know, now that we're sort of doing things, of course, you know, we have IPython open. And I think you, know, you can obviously, if you want to, you can use IPython terminal. I think it's sort of console is the best way. But of course, the question is, how would you open this from scratch? And I've kind of jumped ahead because I'm using my shortcut and I'm cheating. So let me just 
open a fresh command window. So for me, I don't have to activate my environment because I've sort of managed to set things up. I had to set paths and do annoying things to get mine to work. Um, but that's just me. So the main thing idea for most people is yours, of course, will look different because you're on e kind of thing. But the command most of you should be running, if you're on Windows, you know, I think most of you probably succeeded. If you're on Windows, you should be able to, you know, assuming you installed everything normal, you, should, you think the first command here, what it does, is you can see and have a script activate that bad and then econ. What that does is it basically does two things. One, it pretends econ to your, to your prompt. So you'll see econ, that tells you you've activated the econ environment. But what it really does is it just temporarily sets the variable for you so that you know, the right stuff that Python expects or the right directory will be available. This is sort of what we should do when we start these things. If you're running in full Linux, you should be able to write commands. Things like source, you can Linux or OSX, source, which is just a command to run other commands. Silva slash anaconda, bin, activate. And then space, econ. Of course, econ in this case is just the example virtual environment name. It could be anything. And whatever you actually name it, something wants to work in, you can activate the environment you want. And that's, of course, that activates the environment. And it basically puts various paths into the environment, but only in a temporary basis. As soon as you close the command window or the terminal on OSX or Linux, it's gone. In fact, if you never, it says that you never ran that, but only a temporary basis. And then once we're done, the other thing we should do eventually is we should run this command. Once we have our, our environment activated, which is pip install pylint. This is something that will be useful in Spider. Pylint is, helps us develop good practices. It's basically, it looks at your code and then basically decides if it's, if it's new code or has errors or things that can actually be fixed in advance. And so this is not available in Anaconda. And what this pip is, pip is a is the sort of main Python package installer. So again, if anybody, if anybody used R, someone has probably. The R has this sort of very big network of packages and things like that. Python actually has the same thing. It's not necessarily it's still not, not so useful on the scientific side, because the scientific side it contains a lot of compiled code. And so it works fine if you run Linux. If you run OS X, you have the development tools all installed, it might work. Windows, you can also do it yourself. It's extremely painful. And it'll take like, you know, this it's painful if this sort of like an hour and a half has been, it's like ten times worse than that to get everything set up right. You know, so Linux is the only one where it's practical to really install things purely from source. Even OS X, it's a real pain to get everything to work. And then that's because ultimately underlying all of these Python packages, there's Python, but underneath it there's basically compiled code. There's a lot of compiled code that of course that's important so things will be fast, but that's also a pain to get a lot of installers. But once you get away from that side, most Python code is not compiled. And you actually can install all sorts of packages that don't have any compiled code just using this command pip. And all pip is going to do, I have it working on mine, is pip, for example, it does two things. It installs things. You can also use it to see what's installed. So there's a giant. So actually, someone's asking. I don't know why I forgot about this. But so we can use pip. If you actually want to see, if you have your environment, you've activated it. You can actually see what's installed by typing pip freeze. And that will actually give you, you know, probably a pretty giant list of packages. And we can see that a lot of things. It's possible there are things here that are actually beyond what I asked for. Because, again, I set this up sort of independently in my instructions. But, you know, it's based, you know, more or less these are things that we sort of saw in there. Some of the main ones are like Panda. NumPy, SciPy, and so on. But what the other usefulness of PIP is you can actually use it to simply install things. Unfortunately, if I run, if I try to tell it to install PyLint, so PIP install PYLINT, of course for me it tells me it's already there because it is already there. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a small package I could install that I know would install. I'm not sure what that would be. Um, I already have that too. 
that. So, so you know, so there is a sense that you know, certainly in part of us getting everything together. So for those of you who haven't installed, it'd be useful if you could activate your environment and try running this command. So the first thing is make sure you can activate your environment. There's no way to let you do. Do you have any troubles with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can do it in terminal, but I'm not. Yeah, you can do it in Python. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, you only do it in terminal. Oh, it's not. It's nothing to do with Python. This is actually a for a terminal activation. It's a terminal thing. And it kind of happens before you run Python. But it is a useful for some Python bunch of stuff about where to look to find stuff. So it sounds like things are okay. Over here, you should be able then to run this sick command to install the Python. Of that, it's very tiny. I'm 
Hopefully most of us have PyLint installed, I hope. So now the other thing, of course, is now you know how to install other packages. So basically you have these, you know, these two commands I talked about earlier. So especially if you ever decide you want a different, a different, uh, where that command go? Sorry. So obviously you, know, you can install more using conda install. The other thing I sort of just wanted to mention with conda is if you want to upgrade, so after a while, you might find there's a new version of something out there. For example, the new version of NumPy. NumPy you probably have to be 1.7.1 on there. There's a new version of NumPy, which is 1.8.0 that just came out last week. That actually it does have a couple of useful functions that uh, I would use. It's not available through Conda yet. Conda hasn't actually, you know, they're just a little bit behind. They're a bit conservative, which is probably the right thing to do. They don't necessarily want to always be on the bleeding edge of this stuff. But, you know, when the time comes, it's just conda update, and then 
more or less the same syntax, the name of the environment, and then the package you want it to update. You know, or a list of packages. It could be the long list again, or maybe there's just one you want to update. And again, it will sort of work out all the things. The other thing it can do is it can update itself, which is, again, useful when new versions of Convict come out, so that if they fix bugs, add more features, whatever, hopefully it gets better. You can update itself, and you can also use it to update the main Anaconda installation. So these two lines, conda update conda, normally when I'm going to try to update packages if I think something has come out, I always run these first two lines here first, conda update conda, and conda update anaconda, just to make sure the core part are all still up to date and have the latest versions that they expect. Then what that does, if I really want to sort of take an existing virtual environment and upgrade it, then you know, I would use a command like this. So it's conda update in my environment. And buy the package or list of packages that I want to sort of that I want to update. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, as far as I know, there's no way to kind of just update all the packages you want if you want to do that. You have to meet them one at a time. But again, unless you know there's some feature that's sort of fixed or better, you know, for you, there isn't a lot of sort of reason to update for most of the time. So I just wanted to sort of make sure that we sort of see these and sort of again things you can do, but they're not a big deal. The conda stuff, unlike most of the other things we're going to talk about. It doesn't need to be done inside of a virtual environment. It doesn't need to be activated. It's just something you run from the terminal or command prompt. You know, so it's the same sort of ideas there. You just run the same things, but you know, that's the sort of main story sort of behind doing using conda to update. And the first thing, now that we can do things and we can sort of launch things, the first thing I just want to show you and show you why we never want to use it is if you have your you have your environment activated. Mine's never going to be activated because I have a weird setup, but yours should. If you just type Python, you know, as soon as you Python, or Python is you know, when there's no ABXC, it will automatically choose that one that's there. This is what you get. You know, some of you, in fact, you're sort of a bit ahead of me, you're playing around with slides or anything. You can see actually the command very similar to this. You know, this obviously tells you things about the version or whatever. But, you know, what you get, and you literally know, is you see these three dashes. I'm sorry. You know, if you're pretty brave than this what they are, of course. I know, if you ever look, you also see this all the time. It's sort of standard Python nomenclature or command prompt. But of course, the Python one looks very different in the one, in the two, and so on. This command prompt is completely useless. You actually get nothing from it. You know, obviously, you can type things in it. You know, I can type the same commands, but you don't get any autocompletion, no history, basically nothing. There is no reason to ever, you know, directly use sort of Python, certainly for any interactive stuff. When you get to the point of actually running stuff, you probably will run it just with straight Python because it isn't necessary to use sort of IPython. IPython is very useful for writing stuff and doing these forward type work. But if you ever say do simulations that are going to be running for, you know, three or four days or kind of thing, there's, you, know, you can just run things against Python there. And when you want to do that, again. So you didn't even exit, which I'm used to in IPython doesn't work. You have to put the sort of parentheses around to tell it called the exit function, which is what it's doing. But we are, when the time comes, you'll just simply type Python and then the name of a file. It's not that. But Python, this, of course, won't do anything. There is no file.py. But this is kind of the simplest way to run something in Python. But there are much more interactive ways to do it. But this is kind of the lowest level sort of access. And in some sense, what I think is, is pretty useless. But so once we sort of, hopefully I've convinced you of that, you know, I think the first way to sort of do things is if we go to scripts, most people, again, have sort of succeeded. We have IPython. And the other thing that's actually very useful, and we're basically running out of time, so I don't know if I should just save it. Uh, maybe I should just end here, because we've had a kind of mild disaster of the first class. But it will get better, I promise. The one thing, of course, is people assume they're not going to flee and never come back, which is maybe a possibility after this sort of first disaster, is to make you try to get this environment working. We're going to have another class on Tuesday. If you can't get it working, send me emails. I mean, I've tried, and there are things that don't work out. Of course, I think the most important thing they have working, right? It's good. So I can see sort of have who thinks that environment is working. 
pretty good. I'm not evil. So do I have no plan this won't work, but they don't wear it, so it's okay. So you know, sort of self-awareness is important. And so what we'll do next time, so it's really starting to get your sort of environment working. And you know, you obviously have the stuff I talked about today. My notes have a kind of pretty I thought pretty straightforward, also an explanation of the things to sort of to sort of do and, and, and how to do it, sort of line by line. Um, but also feel free to email me if there are sort of difficulties about you know something went wrong or you're confused or you said something weird or whatever. And I'll try to get back to you because it would be really useful. I think they all have more or less a sort of working installation on Tuesday. And then we'll sort of all be up to scratch. And then we can really sort of keep going and sort of full speed ahead and really sort of do some stuff. So was there any other point about the story I've up? Or the right is tired of what time? question, how do you determine whether you sort of have things installed right? So the idea is you open QT, you open sort of IPython QT console. That would be the first command you would run. That will open the sort of QT console thing. Then once you've done that, if you want to figure out whether things are sort of the way I think they should be, you could type import sys, which import, which we're now starting to see a lot, which we see a lot. Bring the functions that live inside the package sys, make them available to me. Of course, originally nothing is available until you import it. And then if you want to see it, you can type sys.path. And what you should see is you'll see things like this, a bunch of directories. And again, for me, pretend that econ and text are the same word. But you should see starting from
It's that kind of danger. 